<laughs> so he beat me so hard. And it's like he could have beaten me before he beat me. Oh, he's playing But he decided see. to keep me alive for ah. longer just so he could beat me later. And, like, so at the end of a game of chess, you always shake the other person's hand, right? That's just how you end a game of chess. They beat me. And so I go, and I'm like, all right, this 8-year-old just, like, spanked me through the roof. But I'm going to shake his hand. So you be me. Uh-huh. You give me like a real handshake. Okay. I'm going to be the eight-year-old, right? Yeah. Real quick. Oh, yeah. oh, and he look at you. He did it. Manuela, com atenção, que o Ruka pode parar. Se entra na escuridão, tem um puta que vai pagar. Hello everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Two Little Feet Podcast. Uh, my name is Terrence Greer, joined today by my co-host Francesca Pena. Hey y'all. Hey. And today we have on the incredible Mr. Ian Orr. How you doing today, sir? Doing well. Hey, yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess we, we know you from um, seeing you out dancing, man. I said going to fed with Tian and Peter. Yeah, bro, you have, uh, you're very good, bro. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. no, seriously, that's why we had to have you on the show, man. Um, so I, I thought, I, I didn't really know this, but I thought, um, I guess you were dancing kind of like Brazilian Zoo, but I guess it's actually more so M Zoo. Is that your specialty? Uh, if you see me out dancing at a place that's playing that kind of music, the thing that's probably the base technique of what I'm doing is going to be M Zoo. Okay. And M Zoo is of a similar lineage as what's referred to as Brazilian Zoo or Zoo Tradicional. Mm hmm. But there's uh, the the family tree breaks slightly, okay. slightly above there. So yeah, Mzuk's from like Spain, if I'm not mistaken, right? Okay, so um, oh maybe not. I, I could be mistaken. Yeah, yeah. It's no, you're not mistaken. It's just like uh, there's there's multiple facets to the okay. story. So you have Lambada, right? Which was this very small cultural small town thing, and um, you had these. Europeans, a particular European who came across this little cultural dance, everybody would get dressed up and do this really sensual dance together. And um, he saw it, and he saw that it was really marketable. He saw it was something that people would really be into. And so he made a Lambada band and called it Kaoma. And he started to promote this idea of Lombada everywhere. And Lombada was already in, like, Rio and stuff like that. But the style that was in Rio was a lot more similar to maybe what you would think of uh, an onto salsa looking like. Oh, really? Instead of what you think of, like, your traditional Lombada to look mm-hmm. like. So you mean, I guess, kind of linear? Or would you... It was, so yeah, it was. It didn't have the complete circularity like the Lombada mm. in, um, in Porto Seguro had. Excuse me. But, um... It had a lot more counter pressure than you see in uh, in salsa. Usually, salsa the energy is kept very inward. Right, right, right. But uh, this was a style in Rio of lambada where you saw very outward energy, and you would use that centrifugal force to really make the dance move. And that's where you harnessed it. But the version that this guy got a hold of was what he saw in um, in Porto Seguro, which was like a little thing. And that's where he got all the girls wearing short skirts with thongs and all the okay, guys with no enough. shirts on. Because that was a little costume you'd wear when you'd go dancing. Mm-hmm. And he spread it and he started his band. And uh, his band, Kaoma, did the song. The da, na, 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 da, na, 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 It's like the classic Lombada song. Then J-Lo did a remix of it where she ah. sampled it. But that's Kaoma's Lombada. And that song is like the Lombada song. And it came out all over the world and it became really, really famous. And they even made movies. They made a Lombada movie, and then they made a Lombada 2 movie. Oh. Man, if you're ever like, you're like, I want to lose an hour and a half to my life to to just waste, check out Lombada 1. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, and you highly recommend it. So bad. It's so bad. Oh. So bad. Why, why do you say it's bad? <laughs> I mean, that's like, I don't know. Like, why do you say the movie's bad? It's a bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's poorly made. It's so bad. But, like, great. It existed. Is it a documentary? Like, what no, is it? no. It's like a drama. Okay. Yeah, it's like a Lombada based drama. Okay. <laughs> All right. Like, like, I don't know. Maybe see it. I don't know what your life is. <laughs> I wouldn't watch it again. <laughs> you put that on right now. I appreciate the warning, bro. I'll <laughs> keep that in mind. But, um, yeah, so they made movies and it's huge. But then, like, I guess what happened <laughs> was um, it got too big for its britches and people got sick of it. Got sick of what? 
is Lambada. Oh. This whole culture of Lambada because like it was really flashy and you had it was called like the Forbidden Dance. And it was I, I've heard where that. The yeah, church yeah, was like yeah. you shouldn't dance Lambada. And they were feeding into this image, and it was like sequins and just all this. And then people were just like, all right, it's, that's enough of this, okay? That was fun. We're done with it. Mm. And the musicians stopped making Lombada music. And all the clubs that had opened up everywhere for Lombada, because it was so big, especially all over Rio, closed down. Damn. Because people just weren't feeling it anymore. I guess, yeah. And um, kind of right when this happened, you had these pirate radio groups from Brazil mm. and they were picking up music from the Caribbean. Exactly. That's where they were picking up Zook music, yeah, right? Zook music. Yeah. And they also had the ships that would carry the liquor between the islands and Brazil illegally and they would also take records. Mm. They'd have a lot of Zook mm. albums okay. they'd bring with them and that's how the music... So this music's coming into the clubs right while all the Lombada clubs are closing. So all the Lombada dancers start going to these clubs playing Zook. And they start dancing the Lombada to Zook music. Exactly. That's what it is. Exactly, right. yeah. So I, I've, people get upset, man, when you say, um, like, you're dancing Zook. Because when you're dancing Brazilian Zook and just labeling it as Zook. Because Zook is more so of Caribbean music, right? Oh, in terms of, well, no. So the dance, there's, like, actually You're dancing thing. Lombada music to, or Lombada to Zook music. No, there's actually a dance considered Zook Tradicional, okay. Brazilian Zook. That's its own dance. Brazilian Zook, right? Yeah, You're so right, there right. was actually a council. There's, like, a council of Zook dancers, which is really funny. But they have, like, their own, like, little political group. And they tried to have a vote to propose that the name of the dance get officially changed to from what? Brazilian Zook to just Zook. And they tried to pass this whole measure, and then they're like, See, there was a zoo dance before. Well, kind of. It wasn't really before or after. You have the dance that's happening in Guadalupe when the music is going on, which is just like a merengue. No, Because Zook is just like all these different islands had their merengues. Uh Uh-huh. Because a merengue is just a traditional, like any kind of like... two-step. Where you have that feeling that leads you to a two-step, different rhythms, different islands. The one that happened to be the merengue of Guadalupe was zoo. Okay. That's the rhythm that it came out of. And so, yeah, like if you just think of what people just so happen to be dancing to that music being on on those islands, of course, it's just like a two-step, mm-hmm. feel it with your partner. But I think, you know, the place where people would maybe get upset is in that that wasn't really a formalized thing. Like that was people feeling the music and grooving to it, and that's awesome. Uh-huh. But like I feel music and groove to it all the time, but that doesn't mean that I get to label it my dance. Okay, right, right, right. You know? So it was actually the next step where people took a dance and formalized it to that music that made Brazilian zoo. Right, okay. And like you have a story where one particular partnership says, oh, well, we did it. And everybody came to us, and we taught the world Brazilian Zook. That's not true. Okay. The truth is, is it was a whole city of people who used to be dancing Zook, and you have a lot of really creative people, and they're going out, and they're dancing together, and they're adapting. I'm sorry, used to be dancing Lombada, and they're adapting their style to work with this new music. Of course, it's not like two people right, like, right, 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 sat exactly. down and uh-huh. had a vision in the burning bush. Sure enough. Like they were just dancing. But what's funny is, at the same time, you've got this really... Um, great known dancer in Rio who's a Lombada dancer who's just like in Lombada he's like you watch old videos of Lombada and it's just like fun and they're going he was one of those like old timers and he was also a capoeira master uh, who is this and uh, he moved to Spain to Mallorca before the transformation happened between Lombada and Zou okay. like, kind of right during it Oh, yeah, like right during it when it really was happening. And he got to Mallorca, Spain as a performer. He was going to dance there as a performer. And these club owners, there was a little club called Made in Brazil in Mallorca, Spain. And they were like, you know, if you want to, if you don't want to go back to Brazil, you can stay here with us in Mallorca and we'll give you a job here. You can be our dance teacher. And you can teach classes, and you can work as a performer here at our club, and you can stay in Mallorca. And he stayed. And uh, that was over 20 years ago. Who was this individual? So, okay, all right. This man. (laughs) uh, (laughs) I'll continue. um, As he continued, he continued to dance Lombada as the music was changing to Zouk, but he wasn't there in Rio 
when all those people were working together and making their version. He was alone in okay. Spain with this very unique mind for looking at things and creating unexpected solutions. Okay. Um, and now to this, where he is now, is he has achieved what I know to be the dream of his life. Are you talking about and yourself? This is Mestre JJ. Oh, okay. This That's is just... Jefferson Costa <laughs> de Oliveira, who's um, a mestre of capoeira, and he has his own school of capoeira and dance mm. in Mallorca, Spain. And he created his own style of zook in Mallorca. So it was Mallorcan zook. Is that what it is? So it's M zook. Okay. Mm. So he comes from the roots of Rio de Janeiro style lambada, not yeah. Porto Seguro style lambada. And he brings that lambada to Spain and he has to teach it to Europeans instead of to Brazilians. So he has to have, you know, Europeans, they always want to ask why. You know, they don't just want to be like, okay, I feel it, I get it, I'm in it. They always need to know why. They have to ask the question all the time. And so he has to think about the dance in a totally it's different, different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has to have these systems and these techniques that are really, guy, yeah. really specific. And um, so that's how he creates Mzook. And everything in Mzook is built just like any very basic system that you've ever worked in. You've got a few fundamental rules that you start with, and then you stack on them little mm. by little. And everything, you can always check to the rule before it to make sense of why the next thing's happening. Okay. So you build this little structure that way. And then once you really have command of the structure, you use play it with as right just a, a medium for expression. Right, right, you right. forget about the structure. Okay, right, right, right. Yeah, and yeah. now it's just trained muscle memory exactly. to give you... So you're not always second guessing yourself. Mm-hmm. That's you that's, that's like any dance. Up. I get you. Yeah, yeah. You learn the basics. Mm-hmm. And right, sure enough, I understand that. Exactly. And so and so he's um, yeah, he's teaching Mzu, you know, and everything. How does it uh, you know how it expands? Like yeah, it just gets popular. Like, is YouTube is it YouTube or what? What happened? No, it's before YouTube. So he took on two young students. He took, he had six original students, and two of them were this brother and sister, I think maybe 10 and 13, from Mallorca, named Daniel and Leticia Estevez Lopez. I don't know if it's supposed to be Estevez Lopez or just yeah, Lopez no. or they just had, Estevez. They had like two it's all in there. <laughs> um, but they are really the pupils of his from that first set of students that stand out. And they really devote themselves to it. And from such a young age, mm. they're training as Zook dancers. They're not training as ballet dancers who also do Zook. They're not training as, you know, people who are coming into Zook. They are from a young age trained fundamentally in Zook. Uh. And so they're like true Zook dancers. So real quick, um, they're training as Lombada dancers? Or, or is that a safe to say? I'm just like, curious. So that's what's funny is he doesn't even know that the word has changed uh, in the beginning. Okay. He's just doing his dance to Zoom right, music. Right, okay. And then when he goes back to Brazil, they're like, that's not Lombada that you're dancing anymore. And he's like, okay, I don't know. I've just been dancing. And they're like, yeah, it's more, it's, um, you have to call it something else. And so mm-hmm. that's when Zook Lombada became more of a word. Okay, okay, okay. It was kind of the need to identify because it was too far from Lombada to call it Lombada anymore. Mm. The, the evolution of a dance then, right? Sure, you have wherever that moment is. It's like, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror every day. You don't see that you look it's any different. Changes. But you see somebody a year later. Sure enough. Yeah. I get you. So somebody saw him a few years later, and they were like, that's <laughs> real different. <laughs> I get you. I get you. Yeah. So he's training up um, the two children. I forgot. His. Right. He's got the six students. Daniel and Leticia are two of them. They're kids. They're going all at it. And he also does. He's a capoeira mestre, so they're working in capoeira, too. And um, as they grow... He kind of passes the mantle to the two of them to carry on Emzu past him because he's he's got his his life like right. he's in such a good place he's got his school he's got his two sons like he's in Mallorca and he's perfect there you know? like he's like he's amazing and he could always travel and do amazing things and I think he still has some traveling but 
at that point in his life, I think he was happy to, to be at his school and let other people travel. And um, so Daniel and Leticia are the ones who really started to bring the style of dance out to the congresses, mm. out to the existing Zouk events. And this was a long time ago. Like this is what, before uh, Zouk was big. Like, could you give a year to it? Like, what would you mean? 90s? Like mid-90s. Okay, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, well, let me see. Mid-90s, what are we? It's 2009. Yeah. No, we have to be talking the late 90s, early 2000s, 2000s that they really got going. It has to be then. Okay. So, yeah, we're talking late 90s, early 2000s. Hmm, okay. And um, the funny thing is, is like they're the first international teachers who are really getting recognition who aren't from Brazil. Uh -huh. And so they're having to deal with a lot of pushback from that because there's this Brazilian sense of like ownership of the dance. Oh, yeah, and like, right. What are you doing teaching our dance? Like mm. You haven't even come and trained with us in Brazil. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the way they got respect was they just went and danced harder than everybody sure, else, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, like, eventually the community was like, all right, you know what? You're you're part of it. Like, you're in. And, um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'll, sure, I'm sure parts of the community of course, still haven't said that. I want you Hey, if you could leave a like and subscribe to this video, that would be amazing for the channel. Let's get back I to this episode. <laughs> I want to ask you this, man. Um, I'm still new to the zoo scene and everything, but is it possible for someone who's maybe trained in, you know, um, Brazilian Zook to dance with an Zooker? Is that, are they compatible? Absolutely. Okay, okay. Absolutely. So, um, Kayo, Kayo Victor, student of Sheen and Luciani, the great souls of dancer. If you know Kayo, check out Kayo. Um, Kayo once referred to M. Zook as the ballet of Zook. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, um, the follows in M. Zook can follow anybody. Okay. They can follow anybody. Because it's like, if this is the world of options, which is M. Zook, this is the world of options, which is Brazilian oh. Zook. And that's not entirely true. There's a couple motions within Brazilian Zook that kind of sit outside of the M. I said, you bubble. might be making some enemies right now. But it's okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not to, it's not like a superiority or an inferiority <laughs> thing. It's just... Uh, it's just a how broken down it is. Like okay. every motion in Mzook, if you practice doing it one direction, you also practice doing it the other direction. If you practice having the, the woman go through a certain series of motions, you practice doing the same thing and how to maintain momentum but have the man go through that series I, of I motions. That's what I saw. That I was, We watched some Mzook and we didn't know who was leading. That's because we switch a lot. Even if we don't switch... The lead is still any motion that the follow can do. It's also an option for the lead to do the same oh, thing. Yeah, it was very different. He just has to do it with a different energy of motion because he's the lead. Mm. He has to guide the momentum, mm. whereas the follow has to absorb the momentum and interpret the momentum. Okay. And so you have to change the way that it feels, but at the same time, you keep all opportunities open in Mzook, and you an you're always analyze, you always look at direction, what's available to me direction-wise, what's available to me in terms of where this is happening in the partnership. Are you doing it? Am I doing it? Or are we doing it? Mm. Or are neither of us doing it? Which, you know, like, it, it, I mean, that seems like a moot point, neither of us no, doing it. You. But you have like a certain thing where um, if you're studying what hand you're going to turn somebody with, I can turn you with my left, I can turn you with my right, I can turn you with both hands, or I can initiate the turn and turn you with no hands, right? So you got to think of the yeah. neither option. Or like, we could both spin, or we can not, neither of us could spin. It gives you pause. So in Mzook, we're always looking for how the tree branches. Uh, I'm curious, man. Is there, um, it seems like it's very creative. Like, I don't know, I, I want to say more so than other dances. Do you, when you're learning Mzook, do they teach you patterns, or is it, is there, are there even patterns to Mzook? Not really. I didn't think so. Okay. Not really. We have four basic steps. And kind of the first thing you learn is you learn those four basic steps and you learn them inside and out. And then you learn these little variations that start to grow the basic steps. And you start learning how to chain the basic steps together. Mm. But you can, of the four basics, you can chain them in any pattern you want. You can make a little three-step... Uh, quarto, quinto, displaza. One, two, three. Three steps stuck together. Boom, boom, boom. Or you can have something that goes on for, for two measures or for, for um, 
for two full turns of the music. Okay. If you want to have motions that do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, it seems like it seems very creative then. When, when dancing, it seems like I, that's what it looks like. But then, like too, like you have to. Creative is really in the realm of the person dancing. Right, so no. Like I don't really. I don't think I'm any more creative with this one cup than I'd be with these three cups. Okay. You know, I could do some pretty creative stuff with this cup. Okay. Like, I could, like, turn it upside down on your table and, like, like it spill everywhere. And, yeah. like, I mean, you wouldn't be super happy about it, but it'd be <laughs> kind of creative. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> so, um... So you're saying you don't think it's any more creative than salsa, or what you saying? No, say? I mean, I don't, I don't really... I have a hard time seeing any dance as more creative than any other okay, dance. Okay, sure enough. Um, maybe you can get into the world where you're talking about, like, purely choreographed dances... That's what I'm saying. I feel like, so if you see if you see me dance salsa and you see someone else dance salsa, you'll see some similarities. If you see two Mzukers, are they, is it the same dance? So that's, okay, so there's like a place where you can give Mzooks some credit because what is cool is you can watch a lot of Mzook students and you can see a lot of difference in what they're doing, but they can still be doing Mzook properly. Okay. And th that is, but I don't think that's so much a product of the dance. I think it's a product of the type of people who are the keepers of that dance. Okay. I think the people like JJ and Daniel and Leticia, and then, you know, the instructors who have come off of that, even the level like Johnny and Diego and um, Antonio, who did their own thing. And you have this next generation of teachers like myself and uh, Flavia de Marta is another teacher here in the U.S., um, and we all, I think part of the process, just not even, just the, the people that it attracts. Okay. It attracts people who are, they're not just different. They're actually, they're, um, they're really stoked on that they're different. Okay. And there's not much desire to change that. Okay. Just so. And like, if you would be my student, the reason that you and me would work as a student and teacher would be because you can be in a realm where you don't have the desire to change who you are as a person, but you also respect me enough as a teacher to know that I'm not trying to change you as a person. Okay. I'm just trying to help give you some tools. Okay. And when we have that mutual understanding, that's when that MZU teaching process works. Okay. Don't know. Yeah. Hey, I'm curious, man. Tell me, uh, tell me about, I guess, your beginner stage in MZU. Like, how did you get introduced to it and, you know, what was it like for you learning it? Um, I was teaching traditional soul zuki. I can't say soul zuki because I'm definitely in no way a student of the soul zuki company. Oh. I don't want to disrespect your process, guys. But I, I trained some soul zuki and um, I trained some zuki traditional. So, okay, okay, well, listen, what did you start with then? Like. What's your, what's your dancing background? Let's start with that. Dance. Oh, my, my background, background. Um, my mom was a dancer. Okay. She studied dance in college and music. And that was something that ever since I was really little, dance and music was a big part of my life. And I've been playing instruments and dancing ever since. Actually, it's funny. The one, my mom, both of my sisters, my mom, when they were babies, my mom would turn their hips out as babies because it's a baby. Your joints are completely exactly. loose, so you yeah, turn yeah, your yeah. baby's hips out. And then if they ever decide to do ballet, you got that nice natural turn out of the hips. Mm. But my mom was like, my son's not going to want to do ballet. Why would I do that? So I was like, one kid, she didn't turn my hips out. Uh -huh. You know, I'm the dancer. Yeah, so I know. <laughs> yeah, you're the one in the family yeah, that dances? So now I'm, yeah. I'm so enough. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, so enough. It's yeah, unfortunate, I wish, man. I wish I had that turn out. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so she had me dancing from a really young age, all kinds of stuff, traditional dances, more like formal dances. But that was always part of my life. Um, kind of went through. I was a swing dance teacher okay, when I was sure. like, super young. And I ended up, that's a whole other jaunt of a story that we can get into later if we want to. But uh, I ended up finding Zook through, through Odd Channels. And uh, my partner and I at the time actually hosted the first Congress in the United States that headlined Zook. And that was the Modern Latin Dance Festival. Where? And when? In Knoxville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. 
And that was in 2010. Okay. Maybe 2011, 2010. Okay. And uh, we brought Willem Engel from, um, from the Netherlands, and we brought Kim Rotier, who I think just had a baby. Okay. We brought Kim from New York, and um, they came down, and they taught. And we also had salsa and bachata, because we are like, we're not ready to just have zouk mm-hmm. in the U.S. But Willem stayed with us in Knoxville for a chunk of time and trained me and my partner. That's awesome. And... Uh, my partner and I, we did the very bad thing that no dance instructor should ever do. We played one ahead with our students, and we just made sure that we always knew a little bit more, more than our okay. students. So we could always have the next class. Don't ever do that. It's a terrible way to teach. If you teach that way, shame on you. Right. But um, so at some point, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I guess it could, like I had done a lot of other styles of dance, but I just didn't have access to the instruction that I wanted in Zouk here in the United States because there was just nobody here who was actively teaching. I say, I feel like I haven't really heard much about Zouk, honestly. So. Yeah, like, and especially at that time, like, Kim was in New York and she's incredible, but at the same time, I just really didn't feel like living in New York. Okay. <laughs> but, like, I mean, I guess that's that like, should have living, man. I should have gone to New York. But, okay. no, I mean, but just the style that I wanted wasn't there. And I was getting really disappointed. And even though, like, I was an instructor, there was the part of me that was like, what am I doing being an instructor? Like, I think you, I you got confidence or what? No, like, confidence wasn't an issue. But just, like, what right do I have to okay. be teaching this? Okay. Because I really haven't had, I know I haven't mastered this. Okay. If I'm being honest with me, if yeah. I'm going to sit down and look at myself in the mirror, like, I know that I haven't mastered this. So what am I doing? kind of standing in this position of being an instructor right? where people look at me and they see my mistakes and they're like, oh, that's how it's supposed to be because I'm the teacher, so they assume what I do is right. Exactly. But it's my mistakes that they're, they're adopting. And that's how you get these kind of bastardized that's versions what happens, of dances. Exactly, is people being irresponsible. So I was getting really upset with myself. That's something, I'll say real quick, cool. that's something that's happening in the Kizuma community right now. But yeah, it happens in, in everything. In all communities, right, sure. okay, sure enough. Um, but uh, I was getting really upset with myself and really kind of down on myself and uh, disappointed in myself. That'd be the word for, for kind of continuing to teach like that. And once I was teaching at a Congress in Washington, D.C., and Daniel and Leticia were also booked at that Congress. And they have this setup and teach at the Congress. A lot of times they have like one hotel room where they put all the instructors' food in. They send like a text out that, you know, there's food mm-hmm. in that room, and then all the instructors go like to the room and, and they eat. But no, but like it's every day during the Congress. Because uh-huh. that's how they feed us when you're an instructor. Because, like, if they don't want to, like, give you a stipend, because, you know, a lot of these people, like, I understand you're trying to make a dance event. A lot of people trying to make a dance event aren't rich. So you're, right, trying, right, to, like, right. you're trying to make this event happen on a budget. So I appreciate they try to feed their instructors, and the way they do uh-huh. it, they'll get, like, a spread of food, and they'll set it up in a hotel okay. room. Just invite you to eat it. So uh, we would go, and uh, Daniel and I just started chatting slowly. Was this, was this like, uh, I guess, when your idols at that time, right? No, I, I, if I'm going to be honest, I didn't really know who they were at that oh, time. Oh, wow. They weren't, like, I'd seen a couple of their videos, but they hadn't really entered my radar. Oh. And we were chatting, and they just had answers to a lot of the questions that I'd had for a long time. And Daniel's philosophy really sat in line with my own philosophy in a lot of ways and how to approach things and really, you know, where sacrifice plays a role in all this and and what it means to to cultivate yourself in an art in in a real way, in an honest way. And after that I really decided I was like, I'm gonna go to Spain and I'm gonna train with with him okay, and awesome. with them because that's what's gonna happen. Hey. And uh, I started saving money. I moved in with my mom for a little while. Uh, and I got it set, and I moved to Spain. Uh, I lived in the school there. I slept on the floor. And um, so I wh- wake up every morning to my, my mestre with uh, all the capoeira instruments telling me, like, 8 in the morning to get up and come train. <laughs> And I'd be so tired from being out at the Zook event the night before that went to, like, four. And um, so Daniel was really my teacher in M. Zook, and JJ trained me in M. Zook a lot, too. And then um, 
and then JJ also trained me a lot in music and capoeira. And um, how long were you there? I was there for about a year. Okay. I did, um, and then by the end of it, I was uh, I was awarded the title of being an instructor okay. of, of the Spiral Dance Company. I want to hear. Tell me, tell me about that experience, man. What was it like, you know, living in Spain and what was that whole experience like? It was cool. Um, I went with about like what is it like? They have the five levels of Rosetta Stone. <laughs> So I went with Spanish about, like, or? two levels of Rosetta Stone Spanish okay. under my belt. <laughs> I okay. was like, and I arrived. I remember uh, I decided to take the cheapest flight that I could because I knew I wasn't going to be making any money there. And uh, it, was, it took me three days. Damn, just to get out to there? To get to Spain. I was like, I was asleep. I had to sleep in airports. And I got there. I had everything I owned. I didn't, I didn't have to check any bags because, man, but I had, like, you know, they tell you your bag can't be a certain weight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But as long as they don't pick it up, that doesn't matter. It'll be <laughs> as heavy as you want it to be as long as it's not too big. And, man, I had this, like, traveler's backpack, and it was, like, trying not to fall backwards while I was carrying this thing. You, like, pretend it wasn't heavy while you put it on the conveyor belt in the airport. Like, but, um, so I got there, and all I had was the address of the school. Shit. And, uh... I was, like, in this total fog, and I found a taxi driver at the airport who, like, didn't really speak English, but I just, like, showed her the address, and, like, I managed to ask her where I could go buy toothpaste. I remember that. In Spanish. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, pasta de dientes? Yeah, hey. pasta de dientes. That's right. My worries. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... I got to the school, and I went in, and I was pretty sure it was the right door, and I rang the doorbell. It was like 8 in the morning, and I hadn't really slept in so long. And nobody answered Shit. the door. Damn. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. no. Right. I mean, it was just this moment of defeat, because I was like, finally, I could take these bags. <laughs> <laughs> but no, and so I just like, I walked down the street in just this, this complete daze, just carrying my bags, completely destroyed. And um, I'm just looking for a coffee shop with Wi-Fi so I can get some Wi-Fi because my my data doesn't work there. Right, right. And I can communicate with somebody in the school and be like, why can't I get in or am I going to the right place? And I walk and I find, the reason I can't find Wi-Fi is I keep in these coffee shops. I'm like, Wi-Fi. What? They don't know that. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. And I you finally say? get to one, and they say Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. That's it. They're like Wi-Fi, and I was like Wi-Fi. <laughs> one. What? <laughs> and two. Like, that's the same thing. Why can't you get? So anyway, I got it, and yeah, eventually I went back, and I just knocked on the door again, and uh, and there was JJ okay. and, and Gloria, who's another amazing student of, of MZUK, and she's an instructor, and they were just there in the door. And I was so happy to did see them. Did they know you were coming? Like yeah, you said, they knew okay, I was okay, coming, awesome, absolutely. Cool. Like, I, think, I think everybody, like, they knew I was coming, but they, they were hesitant to believe that I was oh. coming because it was this American being like, right. I'm coming to live there for a year and train. And they're like, sure, dude, okay. sure you are. <laughs> Open doors. <laughs> okay. And, um, and there I was. Like, I showed up at the door, and I remember... Uh, Gloria starts, she's like, okay, so you're, you're like, the, the classes started a few weeks ago, so we're going to get you caught up on the material that you missed in the classes. So these are the art projects that we've done. Let me get you your syllabus and blah, blah, blah. And JJ's just back there, and he gets a mattress, and I just see him, like, drag a mattress through, <laughs> and he puts it on the floor. And then Gloria's like, so you have to make sure, I can help you read through any of this because it's in Spanish. And then JJ's like, puts his hand on her shoulder, and she's like, he's like, let him sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, thank you so much. Yeah, I knew you exhausted, man. And I went man. passed out for like a day and a half. Yeah. Wow. And uh, the thing that I woke up to was Daniel, who was like my guy that I've been wanting to train with forever. I heard him giving a dance class in the other room. And I like got out of bed and I walked into the other room and joined that dance class and trained nonstop for a year just living in that school training always that's awesome man um, you, uh, you really immerse yourself in it amazing friends in that community they how, how popular was um i guess MZ, was it popular yeah on the island it was i mean there was a group and that's what they did man and they were good like that's the thing if you want to travel anywhere to dance zook in the world there's a lot of places you can go with more zook dancers than mallorca but if you go to mallorca spain if you go to palma you will have the most amazing dancers in one small space ah. that you have anywhere. 
That's awesome. Like you go to the regular social once a week, and you have more good dancers at that social than you do at your average comedy. Mm. Wow. That's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 my Girl youth in Spain. Yeah. Okay. I never would have known that, man. That's pretty cool. Is it in Palma? Palma? Yeah. Okay. They had little offshoots in other parts of the island, but it's really in Palma now. From what I know. Okay. But JJ is there. The school's there. Daniel lives there. He's teaching there, too. Daniel left for a while. Daniel and Leticia went, and they opened a school in Barcelona mm. called Spiral Dance. Okay. Which was very successful, and it was a big school. And just recently, they, they closed it down, which is a pretty heavy moment. Well, not heavy, but a point of transition in the history of Zouk in general, not just MZouk. Yeah. But um, Daniel's back in Mallorca. JJ is in Mallorca, and a lot of other instructors. Uh, Araceli is there. She's an instructor. Jani, Tony Blue, Miguel is there. <laughs> I want to. That's awesome. I want to get back to you, though, man. So you know, you're training and everything. Right. Um. And I, so you're just practicing every day. Like that, that's your your full time dance at that that's point. That's my life. Dude. That's your life. That's awesome, bro. That's all I do. I don't have a job. Mm. Nothing, man. I go okay. and train. And when I get sick of training, and I'm like, I can't, because I mean, I lived it. Like, you lived I was it, in bro. The school. It was one little coffee shop around the corner called Cafe Alvent. And uh, you just go and you would uh, you play chess with old guys and you would drink Yerba de Mallorca, which is just like, I don't know, it tastes like uh, Sambuca. Okay. It's just their kind of anise herbal spirit. And it's dirt cheap. And you drink Yerba de Mallorca and you smoke cigarettes outside of this coffee shop and just play like all night long yeah, okay. with these old guys. And like, but not the old guys. The old guys, like, 50 50. I could beat some of the old guys. Most of the old guys could beat me. But the bummer was this is the coffee shop where all the kids on the island would come to take chess classes. Mm -hmm. So a couple times a week, these kids would come, and these punk kids would just kick my ass. Yeah. <laughs> like they would just destroy me. They were so demoralized. No, I understand. This one punk, he was so good. He was like, he was one of the best chess. He was the best on the island. He was like the champion of Mallorca. And he was one of the best in Spain. And he got on the table when I was playing. And so it was me against him. And, like, sometimes you have the chess games where you know the other guy's just fucking with you. Like, he's that much better than oh. you that he's just fucking with you. And um, can I say can I say that? Of course, bro. Okay, cool. I know kind of. You straight, you straight. It's like a Disney podcast. Yeah, you get you get you get <laughs> Sorry, Disney. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that in there. Oh. <laughs> um, <but>, uh, <laughs> so... He beat me so hard. And it's like, he could have beaten me before he beat me. Oh, he's playing But he decided you. to keep me alive for ah, longer man. just so he could beat me later. And, like, so at the end of a game of chess, you always shake the other person's hand, right? That's just how you end a game of chess. And it beat me. And so I go, and I'm like, all right, this eight-year-old just, like, spanked me through the roof, but I'm going to shake his hand. So you be me. Uh -huh. You give me, like, a real handshake. Okay. I'm going to be the eight-year-old, right? Uh -huh. Go for it. Oh, yeah. Oh, he didn't look at you. He did, oh, he thought... Just the, just the feel, yeah. Yeah, cool, man. Oh, man. He like starts talking to his little eight-year-old girl who's more into him. <sighs> like, I'm like, God, this guy Damn. just destroyed me. I still have a vendetta. Like, once of turn, course. When he turns 18, you know, <laughs> once he's legal, I'm going to go punch him in the face because I can't punch a kid. But once he's old enough, oh, oh man. man. I understand. Man. I don't know much about chess, but I just would have said that. Would be a good set too, yeah, man. Wait till you're 18, man. <laughs> oh, I thought about it. I sat up at night. That night afterwards, I was like, once that kid's 18, I'm going to punch him. Wait 10 years. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. He's going to have no idea why. <laughs> He's going to I'm not going to be able to explain it because my family sucks too bad. That's I'm crazy. just going to deck this kid. <laughs> uh, I get you, man. <laughs> so... Uh, so, yeah, you know, I guess you're living that whole scene and everything, right. man. Oh, yeah. And then, um, I guess, how do you, how do you determine like when you're good? They they give you the certificate and you're like, okay, I can return yeah. home. Yeah, that was the bummer. It got to the point. I don't know. I came home at the right time. No, like, and it wasn't that I didn't have more to learn. Like I could stay there course, with I, JJ and I could learn the rest of my life. But, and I think he would agree with me, I got to the point 
where the philosophy that he was showing me had sunk in. Okay. And, like, I could keep learning and I could keep developing it, but the fundamental philosophy about how you live and how you think about learning and how you think about developing and how you treat other people and how you treat yourself, I, I got the basic tenets, and okay. it gave me something to where I said, I don't want to leave, but I got to leave. Mm -hmm. But I have something concrete enough that I can carry this with me. Okay. So um, that was the point when I could leave and not hate. The, like, I mean, leave and acknowledge that I was moving on. Okay. Instead of abandoning this. Okay. Show sure enough. You know. And so that was kind of, I knew, I didn't know why, but I knew the next thing was to get that same philosophy that I had received about how to interact with my body and I wanted it was time to do that with sound mm -hmm. instead of motion okay because music had been part of my life my whole life but I hadn't had that real thing like I had had with JJ and Daniel in Spain where we really got into motion and we really got into what motion is and studying it and how to make your body do motions. And I knew, just because of the way my life has been, that it was time to do that with sound. And I'd been asking around about like who would be a person who could carry me in that, who would be a real teacher to me, because I've always been in the belief that if I really want to learn something, I need a teacher, and I need my teacher. Um, and I was in Knoxville, Tennessee again, um, and I asked one of my musician friends who I really respected. I was like, you know, who could teach me this? And he was like, there's a drummer in New Orleans, Louisiana, named Johnny Vodakovich, and he can teach you that. And I didn't, like, I had never played drums before in my life. I've been a guitarist my whole life. I've been a vocalist, trained a lot of music theory. I played some drums when I was doing Capoeira, but, like, I'm not a drummer. I don't know. But this guy was like, there's this drummer in New Orleans, and he can teach you. And I was like, all right, I, I go to New Orleans. And so I came here a little over a year ago, found Johnny Vodakovich. I now take drum lessons with him least once a week okay and uh, i have my own drum set nice uh becoming a pretty good pretty good jazz Jeez. drummer dude Jeez. like i'm a pretty good jazz drummer that's like, awesome i mean i'm not a pro like don't don't tony williams me or uh -huh. anything but like i'm not bad like, you, you know you came from like where you came where you're at now and like johnny's really it's it's just like with jj but it's less Parent, which JJ was obvious because JJ didn't speak any English, mm. like this much English. We didn't talk about that yet. How was that for you, man? Right, like that especially JJ because he, he like, he's got his own language. He's got his own thing, and even after living in Spain for over two decades, he still doesn't really speak Spanish. Oh, he speaks shit. like Portuguese. Mm. He's still like I'll make sure. that's what he does, and it's I mean, you can understand. I mean, everybody who speaks Spanish can understand, but yeah. he's just like that's what he speaks. And um, so, in the beginning, like he had a couple of words in English, but I mean, it was really literally me having to learn his language, All right? Because that's what I was going to learn from him. I had to learn his language. Of and, like, he's the master. So it's not me saying to him, hey, you have to learn how to explain this to me in a way that I understand. That's not your job. It's my job to learn how to understand you. And so I can actually understand Portuguese a lot better than I can understand <laughs> Spanish. Because um, we go to the beach, like, every morning. He talks to me for hours and hours. In the beginning, it was just, like, three hours of me sitting there, like... <laughs> And it <laughs> but then, like, it came to the point, and I mean, he knew. He knew I didn't understand, and but he would do it every every day for hours. He talked to me, and uh, and you know, you'd understand a little more, and a little more. He just keep talking to me, and I'd get it a little more. And um, 
Johnny Vidakovich as like the, the the titan of of the jazz, the New Orleans jazz world that he is. Like I mean, Johnny Vidakovich is is the guy who who keeps a certain spirit of New Orleans jazz alive. Yeah. Oh, okay. like that's part of who he is, and he defines that. And he speaks his own language. Like, we both speak English, but Johnny speaks his own language. Okay, sex. And, like, if you want to learn from him and you want to get these lessons that he's given you, you got to learn how to speak that language. So it's cool now. It's like I'm going through the same process again. Always being a student, just, though, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to an extent. You know, I, I don't I don't have a strong horse in the race of the opinion of are you always a student? Am I always learning? Yeah. I'm definitely always learning, but a uh, student is a very serious role. And I think when people say uh, you have to always be a student, they actually kind of lessen the role of student a little too much. Like, yeah, always be learning, but to be a student is a decision. Because if you're going to be a student, it's no less work to be a student than it is to be a teacher. Wow, you're right. And you should take the decision to be a student just as seriously as you should take the decision to be a teacher. Like, if you're like, I'm going to be a student, you got to be ready to be a student. Sure enough. And it's not something that you half-ass. Yeah. But you can learn. Like, I can half-ass. Like, I've been practicing my associated and disassociated beats in my legs the whole time we've been standing here sitting and, like, talking. Okay. But um, I'm not being a student right now. That's not fair. But I'm practicing, but I'm you. not being actively involved in it. Whereas if I'm being a student, that's my devotion. Mm-hmm. So when I'm being a student, I'm being a student. I get you. you so know? you devote, just put all your effort into it, though, really, yeah. right? But if I'm not being a student, maybe, um, maybe I'm being a teacher. Or hobbies, maybe? I don't know. Oh, okay. I, I mean, a, ho- a hobby, sure, yeah. But I mean, when I'm not being a, a student, like there are other things to, to put to. But um, I, I think we have to be careful of the line between what is practice and training and what it truly is to be a student. Okay. Because that's a, a, a sacred role. Yeah. A I'm, sacred I'm curious, man. What's your, uh, I guess, what's your overall goal, though? So you say you wanted to start drumming, right? And how are you gonna, how does that mix with you dancing? I, I have no clue. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's I just, must have zoned out. So where did the drumming come from? Was that just, just on a whim? I just decided that the next thing that I needed to do was go after sound. Okay. That's like what you I say. Yeah, okay, yeah. movement and, like, I really was enjoying the depth that I was understanding movement and seeing it, and I really wanted to have that same relationship with sound. And uh, okay, that's the 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 path that I went down. Show sure enough, turned out to be jazz drumming. Okay, <laughs> uh, all right, show sure Yeah, man, that's just life sometimes, man. It's not a straight path. I, I mean, yeah, but at the same time, like it is a straight path. All right. You know, sure, I, why you not? don't know where you're going, but like, <laughs> it's a straight path to somewhere. Okay. <laughs> like, so, yeah, so you go from a uh, student in, in Imzu, correct? Mm-hmm. To now a student in, in jazz drumming? 100%. What's your, what's your end goal? Can I ask, man? Do you have an end goal in I mind? I absolutely don't, man. Okay. I have no clue where it all ends up. Okay. I mean, I just know that I just, if I go full force, I'm going to end up somewhere. All right. I'm. That's not wrong. You know, like... <laughs> you got in it somewhere. I mean, I have... Uh, I'm blessed with having a lot of trust in my artistic instinct. And so because I have that trust, I can go where I lead myself. Show sure enough. And it's not... I mean, I can't say it's not scary. That's fucking stupid. Of I, know, it's I know it's scary. <laughs> like, I mean, it's... Um, it's always the little tiny dot that, like, there for some reason, there's always the little dot of light. And I'm not 100, like, it's like when you're going through a tunnel, like, you're driving and you go through a big tunnel in the mountain, like, one of the long tunnels in the mountain. And you're not really 100% sure what it's like on the other side of that tunnel, but you do see that little tiny dot okay. of light uh-huh. and you do know that's where you're going. Okay. So, I mean, I know where I'm going, I see it, but I have absolutely no idea what's there. Okay. I want to ask you this, man. I don't want to like bring up anything negative, man. Do um, you have any regrets right now? Do I have it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah. Oh, buddy. I mean, yeah. 
Even I can't even give the cop out of being like it's not a regret, it was a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> like fuck no, there's some things I regret. Some people, yeah, so, yeah, so I said people like to give easy answers, man. I see you're not a fan of I guess giving easy answers. I unless the the answer's nice and easy. Okay, show no. <laughs> I love giving easy answers. Okay. Show no. No, yeah, I've got huge regrets, man. I think um I think the biggest regret is when you, that thing that I referred to as confidence in my art also translates into this ends justifying the means way of living. And there's been a lot of times where I really bulldozed through people people that I really loved and people that really loved me and it wasn't until like because I'm just blasting towards what I'm trying to do and then I look back and I'm like oh shit like what did I do like what did I leave uh, in the wake of this so you, you say just like you being so uh, goal oriented right I mean again that's a little trying to paint me in too positive okay. of a life All if right, I say so. goal oriented then I sound like I have this like beautiful ambition right, that okay. justifies it like, I can't say that. Me being me being focused on something that at a time in my life translated to a very unempathetic approach to living. Okay. That was just very, like, this is what I'm doing, and all you are is Background something here. to help me get where I'm going, mm. and that's it. Like, okay. you're nothing else. Okay. And um, How old are you making ass real quick? I'm 31. Okay, so enough. 31. Okay. Um, man, yeah, edit that shit out. I'm not 30. Yeah. <laughs> I lied. I'm 47. Are you for, uh, which one? I don't even know which one you are now. <laughs> <laughs> are you 31 or 47? 47. Where the hell did 31 come from? <laughs> <laughs> you just made up a number? You really think I'm 47? <laughs> Damn, oh, dude. Oh, shit. I don't know. You know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude. I, I already look 31. <laughs> I don't know what the powers of Imzuk does to, to somebody, bro. I have no idea. You over in Spain and shit, bro. I don't know what they do over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, hold on. How old are you, man? How old you are? Man, yeah, I keep track. That age is number? Yeah. All right, bro. Don't, don't think about it. Uh, all right. We'll forget I even asked, dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you leaving a, a wake of bodies in your past. I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Yeah, um, yeah, right. The wake of bodies. Um, but okay, yes. I mean, that's that's the the honest thing on that is like, and I can say it's a regret. Okay. Like a regret in terms of, I guess the only way that I can really define a regret is like I really would do it differently. Okay. You know, there's I mean, not regret, many yeah. things in my life that I would say I would do differently, but there are points where I. I treated people with neglect mm. or I wish I, I wouldn't have been neglectful and I wish I wouldn't have been so, um, uh, I mean, almost manipulative for my I own understand. ends. You know? like, and that's truly, if I had, if there is a younger version of me walking around out there somewhere, um, you can do what you're doing without fucking everybody else over. Okay. You can, I promise. Yeah, man. <laughs> but that's... Uh, that's a phase that was somebody... Well, I mean, I, I think that's just on, like, your evolution as a person, though, man. You know what I'm saying? You get older, hopefully more wiser, hopefully more mature and everything, man. Right. Like, you didn't kill anyone, did you? I didn't kill anyone. So, I mean, it, it always Nobody be worse, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't this be such a weird point in this interview? You said yes. I was like, <laughs> you got to be careful with those questions. Like, what if I'd kill somebody? I don't really know you like the easy. Yeah, that would have been... would have gone way off the track. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't have <laughs> gone there. Like, what's the follow-up question? <laughs> I don't know what the fuck was. Like, yeah, dude, I killed a couple of people. I don't like shit, bro. <laughs> I'm glad you did it, though. Did me too. Thank you for not killing anyone. Here. I'm gonna be saying I did. Right? All right, but hold on, cool out, man. Let's just go to the next question. <laughs> oh man, dog. Oh, okay. <laughs> what? Are, how about this, man? Let's just get back. Of course, bro. Yeah. What are uh, what are some things that you've learned from dancing that you're able to translate to your everyday life? What are some things I've learned, man? 
Um, when I first got to Spain, Daniel, it was really funny how clear he made it that me, I really was at a point as a dancer that I couldn't grow if I didn't grow as a person. Okay. Like, there was really nowhere for me to go as a dancer unless I grew as a person. And um, you end up in this weird situation where you don't know if you're learning the lesson about how to live from dance or if you don't know if you're learning the lesson from how to dance from living. And it's really serious. It's odd to see the relationship between any of those things and what's causing what. But, um, I mean, everywhere. It's in any form of art that you do, you have to do it honest to, to how you live. And on the other side, you have to live honestly to your art. And uh, one really doesn't come before the other. So I, I guess not being able to separate it, I guess, right? Like this. I mean, but they're separate. <clears throat> They're separate. They just like they're they're recursive. They define each other. Exactly. But they're like equally recursive. It's not like one's within the other. They're both within each other. And um, I mean, I guess that's the thing that I could learn from from dance in life and from any of it. Like, you gotta live your life according to your art, and you have to do your art according to life. Okay. And it's, it's just that. Mm. And, all the other, if you, there's so many other cool lessons that you can learn that are going to guide you towards that, but then you're going to realize that it's just that. And, you know, there's, it's kind of like, it's why there's a million different turns of phrase to, to tell you the same thing, because mm -hmm. uh, we don't all learn the same lesson the same way. So you have to hear it with one set of words, and I have to right, hear right, it right. saying a different set of words, <clears throat> and you, you know, something totally, maybe you don't learn it through words. Maybe you understand it because you hear a song that teaches you that lesson or you move in a way that teaches you that lesson or you see a picture, you know. But at the end of the day, we all learn the same thing. So, um, so you know, you don't always know how you're going to be taught, but, uh, but in the end, it's all the same. All right. I think, like, the way you think about things is kind of crazy, bro. It's different. I'm, like... I'm trying to compare you to, like, saying have you in a room and, like, a businessman or something like that. I feel like it'd just be two different people, obviously. I don't know <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. Obviously, yeah. you're two different people, but, like, I feel like you have a really creative mind or something. Or I guess, like, that's how you grew up, right? Your mom was a... Uh... But my dad's uh, my dad's an engineer who's okay. now a land surveyor. Like I think you, you, you have to resemble your mom more. You have to. Not bro. really, man. No? No. My dad... My dad went to Tulane and got a degree in engineering and then went on to, to graduate school in Cornell. Okay. He's a land surveyor. Uh, my dad's possibly the smartest person I've ever met in my okay. life. Dude's brilliant. And um, not that he's not. He's, he's creatively minded in the creativity of uh, mathematics and in the creativity of um, uh, like uh, topography uh -huh. and stuff like that. And it's a whole other thing. But, uh, you know, I can sit in a room with a businessman and... Oh, I'm not trying to like, diminish you. No, no, you no. I wasn't, I wasn't taking it as a diminishing thing. I was more just uh, trying to get it in a deeper point in that, like, uh, I think a lot of people, they, they, they try to make an excuse with this mentality of, oh, I'm, I'm creative. Okay. I don't do the business end of things. Okay. I'm creative and, like, you know what, dude? You do both or Fuck what? up. You okay. gotta do the business end too. Okay, like, so no. And uh and one end, you know, there's creative business. All right, so and no. to kinda try to to isolate that definition is uh I don't know, self limiting. Okay, so no. Yeah. Let's get let's get into you teaching, man. You're you're a teacher, right? Or what? Are you still Sure, yeah. As far as MZUK, or you teach other things as well. What? Oh I mean MZUK, I I'm a, a certified are you a mixologist, right? Are you you're a bartender or what? <laughs> yeah, a bartender. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Real quick, what's the difference between a bartender and a mixologist? A mixologist, man. It's generally, it's just like, uh, it's just whether you're a total douche or not. <laughs> 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 no, like, I mean, 
if you're not an asshole, then being a mixologist really just means that, like, you study the design of flavors using liquid and alcohol. Like, that's really what it is. So if you have some, like, I mean, so if you have, like, the really technical definition of a chef, Uh like, you could have a chef, technically, this is in a totally hypothetical world. This isn't the real world. But hypothetically, you could have a chef who doesn't even know how to, like, use a stove. He just has this theoretical idea of flavors. Okay. And he can design food based off of that. And then you can have cooks who can then execute, execute the food. Okay. So super theoretically, you can have a mixologist who like understands so flavor. Like and book smart, have, I guess, right or something. Not that it's smart one way or the other. It's just what you do. Uh-huh. You know. And you can have a bartender who executes who those flavors. Does, yeah. Now the truth of the matter is, as we know with any chef, any great chef is also a badass cook. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of people who like espouse being mixologists as an excuse for being a shitty bartender. Okay, so I know. If you want to be a great mixologist, you better be a great bartender. Sounds about right. And being a bartender is about being able to be behind a bar. That's, that's a skill, man. Being able to communicate with people. In a hectic environment. Stay moving, you know, knowing all the recipes, knowing what you're responsible for. Like, I mean, bartending has a history. Like, back in the day... Jerry Thomas, who was the first, like, star bartender in and the late 1800s. Okay. What yeah. makes someone a star bartender? He was just, like, people went to the bar for him. For him. Oh. And the bar was about him. There were pictures of him all over the walls. You said the late 1800s? Yeah. Damn, all right. And he would wear, like, all these golden rings. He'd be dressed up. And he was paid more. He made more money than the vice president of the United States. At that time? Yeah. Damn. Like... So bartender was very much a skill that, and then as it developed, like, it's not that the bartender could design flavors. The bartender was the keeper of the alcohol. Right, right, he kind of right. ran this, I mean, try to get, like, maybe the image of your old Western bartender, your guy that, like, all he does is pour shots and slide them across right. the bar. But, like, he's the, the manager of this social Exactly, plank. yeah, exactly. And, um... That's what being a bartender is to me. It's like managing that social point. Okay. Whereas being a mixologist is about designing flavor. Okay. So, no. Yeah. I was just curious about that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, that's right. That's right. We're talking about teaching. That's what we were talking about. Yeah. So, uh, I want to... Well, do you teach anything besides Zimzu? Because you have a... Hold on. You have a... Uh, let me see if I can find this. Evo Zook Dance Company, is that you or is that something separate? Yeah. So Evo Zook is the company that I created with my partner a long time ago. Previous partner, okay. my current partner. Old partner a long time ago. We made the company together. She split off and made another company called Zook Mia, which is based in Miami. And now she has another offshoot. I think she might have a couple offshoots around Florida. Okay. She's doing really well down there. And I kept Evo Zook going for a while. And then once I started doing more Mzook, I kind of let Evo Zook fall to the okay, side. Okay, okay. And focused more on Mzook and being part of Spiral Dance Company. But then as my vision, not my vision, but I ended up partnering with a ballerina who had also been chaining in salsa recently. Her name's Ashley Roca. That's the one lady we see, right? Ashley Roca lives here. Yeah, I've seen her. We've seen her at the social sometimes. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ashley Roca is this incredible ballerina. And um, she'd also been doing some partner dance. And when I first came to New Orleans, I was scouting. I was looking for somebody to, and I saw her, and I was like, you. Sure enough. And I told told Tina Singh, I was like, Tina, we met this girl at this one social a couple weeks ago. Tina was like, who? And I was like, "Uh, brown hair, kind of crazy eyes ballerina yeah and tina was like i don't know and tina was just sending me all these different <laughs> random women's facebook accounts like is this her and i was like nope not, not, her. not her not her not her and finally tina like sends me a message i was at work or something like that and she was like i found her it's ashley roca and i like i looked and i was like that's her yeah. that's her i saw her facebook message i was like ashley uh we met this one time at this one social come train with me on this date and she showed up. Awesome. She was like, yep, yeah, let's do it. Hey. And dude, she came and she trained so hard. We had this group training session. It was like me and Tina and Josh 
and Ashley showed up. Juice. We had him on, yeah, Juice. Yeah, yeah, Juice. And we were all like, uh, Josh and Tina, they're both, um, they both train really intensely with me and some awesome students. Oh, Tina's we amazing. Together. We're trying to still get her on the show. She's delaying. But yeah, Tina's a great, as far as uh, Zoo goes, man, wonderful. Brazilian Zoo? Tina's yeah, great, she's bro. she's been a really, she's, she was a really awesome student. Hell she yeah. Really, she, um, she's a great dancer. She devoted herself a lot to, uh, to when we were working, and she really opened herself to, to learning ideas. I had a lot of respect for, for her ability to, to tune in. And Josh, too. They both oh, yeah, are yeah, willing yeah. to, to get yeah. in there and, and try something that's different and do something. And yeah. So anyway, we're all training, Ashley, Josh, and Tina, and I. And um, it's cool because, like, Everybody brings their own thing to the table to what right, they right, can right. do, but they're all there to to learn Mzuk and learn this technique, and they're all like bringing their perspective on it. And um, when I started training more and more with Ashley, and she and I started really creating our own thing, and that's when we created a little branch off called Artificial Dance. Ah, uh-huh, something different. Something new. Artificial Dance was the next step, and it was really kind of a fusion of. Her approach to technique and my approach to technique and where we were going, and we were starting to get some momentum with that, but that's when I like really fell deep into the world of music, like really Jazz fell drum, deep, and like so my dance has been sitting on this simmering back burner because oh. I'm so engulfed in music right now. So, but Ashley's still like she keeps it going. She's like there but uh but the morning comes soon when i wake up and i'm like all right it's time to start hitting them together okay so no but uh, so in terms of teaching right now i'm not really teaching any dance i'm doing one event next weekend oh yeah definitely um yeah the uh new orleans brazilian zoo immersion weekend right yeah immersion weekend yeah yeah yeah, that's it. That's one with Tina. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> that's um, June, May, June. June 14th through the 17th next week. I have to wait next weekend, so I won't be able to make it. But yeah, yeah. it's next weekend. I'm just talking yeah, about it. Yeah, it looks like, um, I know she's got some instructors coming from out of town. Mm-hmm. Tina's going to be teaching some yeah, classes. Yeah, that's going to be really cool, man. I wish yeah. I could go. That's it should be. Really cool. And I know she's got, there's like a, an early tier of passes that she's selling now. I know if you get those, they're cheaper. So I okay, know. we took a private. What was some boy's name? We took a private with. What what? We took a private with that dude. What was his name? Man, no. Oh my God, it's a man. West. West. Weston. You know what he's name? Weston. West. He's out of town as well, but he's like he um, he's teaching some zook as well down cool. here. Well, all right, I don't know if you know him or not. He's gonna be teaching with you next weekend. Okay. Yeah, yeah he'll be there with you. His name's well. He was cool. I enjoyed it. It was yeah. cool, man. Awesome. Yeah, it's gonna be an awesome, an, an yeah. amazing weekend. Something entirely different for the Nola scene. Oh, definitely. It's yeah, not yeah. something that we get the chance to see. Nah, not at all, man. Yeah, Zook's, I mean, you know, it. Zook's not really big down here. You know that, right? Man, the whole um, you know Latin dance just got a real late start in this city, mm. and it's coming. But like, yeah. I remember when I used to come down here back in the day, and like. There were just a couple of little salsa nights. Okay, right, right, Like some funky little things that really didn't get going until, I mean, in terms of other big U.S. cities, it's a late bloomer. So it's cool to see, uh, it's cool to see it at this stage where it's really taken on its own identity. Because, I mean, it's had such a strong swing community for so long. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's been so dominant. The jazz jazz community, right, which is... Which Which, evokes the swing. swing dance. That's what comes out, exactly. And so I think that may be kind of, since that was so dominant, it made it so the Latin dance scene here took a little longer to get identity, you know, and, I mean, other factors. But it's really coming along, and there's there's some dancers in this city who, who are really doing it right. Um, I know, um, God, I can't remember the name of the company. Uh, Mara Angel and her partner. I'm not sure. Really incredible, uh, salsa partnership. Okay. Mara Angel and Daryl and Liquid Rhythm. 
Is it Liquid Rhythm? You talking Mary Angel? Mary. Yeah, Mary. Oh, Mary Angel and uh, Daryl. Daryl, no, not Daryl. Derek. 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 Yeah, bingo. Derek. Yeah, we do, we I have them on the show. They're excellent. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of respect for them. I know she has a really great background in contemporary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think he has a background in like martial arts. Uh, maybe. I think I know he did hip hop, but he's a skater and everything. Yeah, it might have been. I, I could be totally off. Yeah. I've only talked to him. Uh, no, they're legit, passing, man. And I, I have a lot of respect for what they're doing. With oh the yeah, scene. man. I think they're they're very they're very real, and I think they're really trying. Oh, to yeah, no, nah, Liquid Rhythms, they're, they're legit, man. I love what they're doing. They um, yeah, they're, they're full time dancers, man. That's what they do. That's that's, uh-huh. that's how they make exactly. their money. That's really cool. That's very awesome for them, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I want to I want to ask you man, about some uh some zoo tips tips and hits if you can give me some, man. Tips and hits. Huh? Give me some, man. Um. So how about we just like um, give me I guess. Nah, I don't need a prompt. I got you. Oh man, I got you. show enough. Show enough. <laughs> um, like anything that you train as a lead, you need to also train it as a follower. Okay. Every single thing, because I promise you don't know how to lead emotion correctly until you've had it led on you. And that's the same thing with other dancers, man. You yeah. you're the best dancer when you can lead and follow. But not even beyond like even if you're. Even if you're not a great follow, even if let's say, and I mean again, I promote that every lead train is a follow and every follow train is a lead. But if you learn a new move, let's say you go to a congress and they teach you a combo, or you go to class, you got to make sure before you go out and try that move that you go through it as a follow. Because mm-hmm. there are things that in our heads as leads we think work, but then you feel it, you're on the other end of it, and you're like, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. And I mean, you experience it, I'm sure, a lot as a lead, where you're like, they think what they're doing communicates mm-hmm. in a certain way, and you're like, that doesn't mm-hmm. feel the way you yeah, think it feels. I, I know how you think this feels. But that's not how this yeah, feels. Yeah, that's not how it works. <laughs> I so, tense up and it doesn't work. I mean, that's why, like, I super respect Argentine tango, because in the real traditional Argentine tango schools in Buenos Aires, like, and when you start as a guy, you aren't allowed to touch a woman for the first chunk of time in training. Oh, yeah. I know you're that. You're only allowed to lead other men. Oh, I know that. Like, you're not allowed to, like, do you to, to practice these motions on someone who can't, who's not in the perspective of that you're leading another, another man because you have to have that experience on oh, both no. sides. Okay. You know? Um so that's a, a big one is that experience is, anything from both sides. Um, do, you, do you do that in your classes? I guess when you did teach, were you? Well, so when you're teaching, you have to, you have to choose what, especially let's say you have a one-hour class. Well, I do so much. I can't right? hit all the targets. Right, 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 right. But I can, the best thing I can teach you is I can teach you how to learn how to practice what we're doing okay um and that's why like you know if you take from me for a long time you're going to learn my language it's the first thing i can teach you i can teach you my language and then once you speak the language then it's really easy for us to communicate mm, right, right, right. it's just like i can say something that's like a big thing we do in mzoop is i can teach you a combo just by saying a series of words and you can go out there and do that combo yeah. that i just said because we have this language. Um, so, I mean, that's the thing, is if you really want to learn as a zoop dancer or as anything else, like, find somebody who you relate to philosophically and learn their language, because then you're going to be able to really learn what's going on. Um, in terms of things that are, like, lighter and more accessible, um, always build... Uh, be honest with yourself about what level you're at. Uh, you're not doing yourself any favors by uh, treating your training like you're a higher level dancer than you are. Okay. You think that, like, even if people are buying it, like, people are like, I believe it, that you're a higher level dancer than you are. You're like cheating yourself, you're right? You're cheating you. Because, yeah. like, man, if you're a beginner student and you're going to high end intermediate level classes because you believe that you're an intermediate, the only person you're hurting is you. You're, you're paying to go to a class that, like... You might not get too much out of it, right? You're missing. 
like or or you're you're getting it but you're not getting the things you need yeah but then on the other end like don't uh don't cheat yourself with your own insecurities like i know people who are ready to move on and who are ready to do higher level stuff and their insecurities keep themselves in this mentality of oh i'm a beginner i'm not that good and it's like if you stop saying that about yourself you would see that like actually some of this higher level material is really something you can access okay so i mean you just you know, spend the time to, to really be honest with yourself about where you're at. Yeah. And once you get a sense of where you're at, then you get a sense of what you need. Right, and right, And then right. you can look for what you need and you can go after yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Like, so that was part of it with, with drumming. Like, you know, I told about the roundabout way, but I noticed that something that I lacked in my dance, I was, I had my rhythms that I could instill into the dance, but I couldn't pull rhythms out that didn't belong to me and put them in the dance. And I knew that training percussion was something that was probably going to be able to give me that ability to pull rhythms out. Okay. And so that was part of my decision in that too, even in addition to kind of the roundabout way that I was talking about was like that I was honest with myself about something that was weak so I could go after okay, it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what you can do for yourself as a student. Like really, being self-aware. You're not beating yourself up. You're not trying to cut yourself down. You know, you also need to be able to look at yourself as a dancer and be like, that's awesome about me. Uh, like you right. have to be able to say that. Show no, yeah. You can't be, and that's hard. I know. It's hard to sit and watch a video of yourself dancing and be like, that I looks pretty good. I don't want to I'm like, oh, shit. So oh, the negatives. Oh, there are not yeah. many people who enjoy watching videos. I mean, even to this day, like... I've been dancing my whole life. I still, when it's time to sit down and watch a video of myself, I'm like, uh, all right, here goes. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you, like, you are your own worst critic, oh, right? Oh, man, like, you know, bring it on, self-doubt. <laughs> like, let's rock and roll. <laughs> but, um, you know, you got to be able to honestly look at yourself and be like, that's good, that's not good. Okay. Or even, like, not judge it. Just be like, that is this and this is that. Yeah, I like that. Oh, and, uh, I would like to, to, to do something else with this move. Yeah, exactly. With a particular move, or like it's cool that I have this, but I need to open my ways that I, mm -hmm. I use it. Like I want to use it in different ways. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, just saying back to it, man. Like you know, live according to your art and make your art according to your life. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I want to ask you this, man. Could you uh, could you give me one tip that could make someone a better dancer immediately? Immediately. Immediately. Instantly. Make you a better dancer immediately. Like, like I'm sitting here at, at like, 12.04 p.m., and at 12.05, I'm a better dancer. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't... I mean, I know it, but how do I say it? Hey. There are things that you can already do. You are already a way better dancer than you're letting yourself be. And the moment that you decide to stop thinking about doing them and to stop trying to do them and just to do them is well, the moment that you will be the dancer that you are. I guess I give you some permission to I guess be great, right? Or be something amazing. Yeah, I mean just whenever you I mean I don't know if you're great or not, but <laughs> I know there's a lot of things that you can do that the only person who doesn't know that you can do certain things are you. Right. There's probably some things that right now you can't do. That doesn't mean you can never do. Them. There's mm -hmm. probably some things you can't do. Um, maybe you, you honestly, in terms of your back flexibility and your strength and your coordination, you might not be able to do a backhand spring to a back tuck, 
You might not. I don't know your life. Maybe you can. I don't know what that is. So I there we go. Rock and roll, <laughs> right? You might not be able to go back handspring and then do a backflip. Okay, okay, okay. You just might honestly not be able to do that right now. Your legs might not be strong enough to get you off the ground. You might not have the coordination to make it happen. But there are things that you, you can you can probably do a back handspring. Even if you've never done a back handspring before in your life, if your brain would just chill out and say, all right, I'm going to do a back handspring. I'm not going to try to do a back handspring. I'm not going to think about doing a back handspring. I'm going to do a back handspring. And then it's going to happen. Yeah. Or it's not. Right. And you're going to do a back <laughs> handspring, and you're going to fall on your face, and that's fine. Something's going to happen. But, um, I mean, so in the same vein of, like, that is, we have such a strong mentality that there's so much to lose in every moment. And that's really the the damaging part of, of growing up and maturity and adulthood. Mm, I get you saying that. Is you develop this perspective that there's always so much to lose. And you got to dial it back. And you gotta, you got to realize that, that in a lot of situations, there's a lot more to gain than there is to lose. You know, in the case of a back handspring, like, everything in your body really is telling you not to send your head towards the ground. Like, as a human, our body's real programmed to keep your head away from the ground. Yeah, like, look man. the way we stand. Like, it's the furthest point. This thing, because this is how you die, is this mm-hmm. thing in the ground. But, like, when you can, like, get with your head and be like, look, man, it's not that hard. I'm going to get my hands back here behind me. You're going to have lots of support. And even though you're going to go towards the ground for a minute, you're going to be fine. And you go, and even if you totally mess up, you kind of fall on your face and feel like an idiot. But you're fine. Yeah. Like, you're fine. You know, like, of course there's the freak situations where you're not fine. But if you're going to talk about that, like, don't drive a fucking car. Don't do anything. You know, like, of course there's always that chance that it could go wrong. But, like, God, please don't live your life that way. Yeah. You know, so don't be so scared about what can go wrong. If it goes wrong, that's fine. And, um... And just allow yourself to do what's already in there. Yeah. You a better dancer now? Um, I think so, bro. Yeah, you a better dancer? Mm, yeah. All right. Yeah. I think so, man. I think I did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. I, I think it takes a lot, you know, to, to actually get get out of your own way, in a sense. That's the issue, I yeah. Mean, uh, I mean, if I were to take that, what you said, and apply it, then yes. Right, which is the the segment. Don't apply it. Just do it. Just do Um, it. Just do it. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We're about to see on my next dance. (laughs) I think um, I think that's a great way to kind of like wrap this up, man. Honestly, I want to say I really want to thank you. You know, saying for taking time out to come talk to us, man. I really appreciate that. Pleasure. Of course, man. Of course, man. I want to ask you, man. Um, I know you're teaching next weekend. Do you have anything else, like any upcoming events going on in your life? Are you going to perform in jazz, in any jazz drum soon? Man, yeah, hopefully. Hey. I'm pretty excited. I've got some musicians that I'm really working with, and we've got some vision. Uh, things are in a baby stage, but I think they're in a very promising stage. Um, so. There's definitely something in the works that's uh, it's going to be something pretty that's special. Awesome. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, keep your eyes open. I, I'm the kind of person who doesn't use social media unless I've got something really important to okay. put out. So if you, uh, if you friend me on Facebook or if you follow me, the only notification you'll ever get from me is when I've got something real big to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if you hopped on that, it would be the place to... To when this uh, this growing little creature hey. becomes something that I'm I'm ready to bring out to the world, that's uh, that would be the first place. That's I'll awesome. Put it. So real quick, how can people get in contact with you? How can they reach you? Sure. I mean, you can find me on Facebook. Um, I'm Ian Orr. I think my, maybe my middle initials in there would be Ian R Orr. And the one um, like my Facebook profile, I'm just like in my underpants with a broom and a pair of sunglasses on. So you find me that way. Um, so you can find me there. I've got a Facebook page for Evo Zoop Dance Company. Again, I barely use it, but 
if something comes, that's where I'm gonna put on if or when it comes. When it comes. You can find me on um you can find me on Instagram under yeah. Evo Zoo. You can find me on Instagram under Artificial Dance. That's art official dance. Okay, I was wondering with okay, I get you. It's a, it's a, it's a, a call out to, to Prince. Ah, okay. His last album before he died was Art Official Age. Okay. Art Official Age. So it's Show like enough. That, Prince just had an album come out. I don't he know did. if it was today. Posthumously, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was it today or was I'm it? I'm not sure, honestly. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard it's pretty ridiculous. Okay. Like, I've heard it's incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, I'll check it out. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think that's a good way to do this, though, man. All right. Does that, any last words, Dama? Uh, thank you. Thank. I think this is like an eye-opening episode. Um, very different. Uh, the vibe is very different. Um, so thank you. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know how else to put it. Right. But it's very different. And I think um, as dancers or people that are, um, are trying to express to express themselves, right, to have the visual art through their bodies. Uh, this is this is an awesome episode for that. It takes a lot, but good. Hey, man, <laughs> we can watch this over and over and over yeah, and over yeah. for those amazing advice and just apply them. Three people so thank sitting you. at a table talking. That's <laughs> where it happens. You know, I think I forgot to tell you, man. So at the end of like the interviews, we like to dance with our guests. So I hopefully, I don't know if you're down with that. Hopefully, you'll be able to. Oh, you want to dance? Uh, you cool with that? And yeah, I, most sure. probably, you would probably dance with Francesca. Go either way. Hey. <laughs> 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 Go with the flow. Um, yeah, great way, to, great way to end it, man. I really appreciate it, Ian. Thank you so much, bro. My pleasure. Absolutely. Really appreciate Thanks that. Me on. I um, appreciate it, yo. Yeah, man. That'll do for this episode to the few podcast. Rock and roll. Hey, hey.
good. That's all it is. Hey everyone, uh, if you made it this far to all the end of the video, I want to thank you so much. Um, my overall goal with making these interviews and these episodes is uh, to give a voice to dancers, you know, to give them a platform to speak their story. So uh, if this is of value to anyone, then that, that means the world to me. Um, my overall goal is to give value to the dance community. So, if you find no value in this, and I, I urge you to please let me know where I can improve on. Um, I, I truly want to, you know, just uh, give value and content to, to the dance community. Um, so, please let me know how I can improve, where I'm messing up, because to be 100% honest with you, um, you know, I'm learning along the way as I do this. I, I truly am. So um, to be able to interact with, you know, the dance community, it means the world to me because it, it gives me feedback and it lets me know, you know, what I'm doing right, where I can improve upon, um, you know, what I'm doing wrong, which I feel like might be more important. Um, so please, if you all could, could comment and just let me know what you think, it, it means the world to me because, you know, that feedback just helps me improve. So, um Please comment uh, as well, you know, please like and subscribe. That means a lot as well. Um, but, you know, I want to say thank you so much for for just watching this because it means the world to me. Um, you know, I want to I wanna take you on this journey of the Two Love Feet podcast. You know, I'm, I'm very excited for it. So, once again, thank you so much.